All right. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I have my wingman here, Brother Justin, with me today. I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope Monday night Bible Q&A. And as I said last week, we were going to do our Q&A uh, as I put an email out to see if people were still interested in keeping the Monday night Bible Q and a going and to see some responses. I mean, right now me and brother justice intentions are to keep this thing kind of going for the time being. Uh, but we would like to hear from you. That's it's, it's, it's really good. It's really profitable to hear, uh, from you to say, uh, brother Ed, brother Justin, I really would like for you guys to keep this thing going or, or not. If you don't really, you know, you know, you don't really care if it's going to go. I don't want to make it sound like you're heartless or, you know, anything like that. But uh, some people just, they really don't care if it, it's going or not. It's just no different from any other program they would watch on YouTube. But um, from what I got this past week, I had a, uh, for the people that normally watch, the people that normally follow on the broadcast on KJV Bible Scope, when they really specifically uh, key in on the Monday night Bible Q and a, I had a very good response for the people that, that normally watch. And, uh, I just talked with brother Justin about it. And, uh, it seems like so far so good, uh, very positive responses. And, uh, again, uh, we're going to leave it open for another week. So if you want to make a comment and email me, I trust the Lord Jesus at Gmail dot com you can come in and say brother ed brother justin please keep this thing going or or not you know if, if you just don't really uh, see a need for it then uh then leave that comment we would like to hear your input on that all right well um i like to open up with this thought here um always as we open up uh, our bible q a on monday night is to provoke you with a a reminder of what Christ has already done on the cross for your sins. We are not waiting for a savior to come. We are not talking to one another and trying to figure out when somebody's going to come from heaven and do a work where we can be forgiven of our sins. Jesus Christ has already came over 2000 years ago. Glory to God. Jesus Christ has already completed the redemption plan. Glory to God. Jesus Christ has offered each and every one of us the free gift. If you're a human being today, you have the breath of life in your lungs. Yes, this message is for you. Would you consider trusting and believing that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day? Will you trust that and believe on that for the salvation of your soul? It's just a question. Me and Brother Justin can't force you to believe, but we can certainly be mailmen to deliver you this gospel message of the greatest love story ever told. Jesus loves you. He's not out to get you. He's not out to kill you. He's not out to throw you into hell. He loves you, and he wants to have a relationship with you. Would you trust and believe on him for the salvation of your soul? I hope you consider that today. I hope me and Brother Justin are going to provoke you all throughout this Q&A to lean you that direction as we answer questions. So please consider that today. And I say that I say that in, 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 the, in the lovingness of my heart that you would trust and believe on that. Okay, so I'm going to pass it over to Justin. Let Justin open up. He hasn't been on in a while. Go ahead, brother. Amen. Thanks, Brother Ed. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, thank you for questions. And, uh, yeah, I'm like, like we've. We, Brother Ed said, we, we usually try and say this every time. Be, before we get going, before we answer questions, uh, we have a question for you. Where's your soul going to spend eternity? Can you answer that question honestly? Can you say that you know of a certainty where your soul is going to spend forever? It's an important question. And we would urge you to consider the only way you can know is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He actually rose from the dead. If you if you were going to try and figure out what's going to happen to you when you die, say, well, I've never died before. I don't know anybody that's ever died before. There is one. There is one. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He died. He was buried. And then the third day he rose from the dead, never to die again. So if anybody knows what's going to happen to you uh, or what could happen to you when you die, Jesus Christ would be the one. He's the only answer. He's the only hope. Pray that you trust in him and believe in him. 
All right. Appreciate that, Brother Justin. Always a blessing when he gets on. Amen. And I, I appreciate Brother Justin taking time out to get on here as well. And we always have a good time when we get on here. Uh, just love getting in the Bible, uh, you know, like answering people's questions and and just directing them to the Bible, the word of God. I mean, it's the answer isn't found in Brother Justin's brain in the sense that he has all the answers. The answer isn't found in Brother Ed's brain as if I have all the answers. Me and Brother Justin submit to the word of God, that holy King James Bible. That's where we get our answers from. So if you want to know, you can come up with the same answers that me and Brother Justin have. All you got to do is just get in that Bible and start studying it. Start studying the word of God. Amen. So let's go ahead. Without further ado, let's get to the first question here. And we have three questions today. Uh, Rick from one from Rick and Linda West, two from Michael Odom and three from Barry Bernard. Now, let me also provoke you because I forget a lot of times to do stuff like this is um, if you have a question. Look on the bottom of your screen. See it scrolling across on the screen there. Um, email me your question. It's better for you to email it to me than leave it all over the social media because I have to go out and look for it. But if you put every all everybody puts all their questions in one spot, it's going to be easy for me and we'll probably get to your question because it'll be easy to find. But if you leave it somewhere else, I probably won't be able to find it. And then you'll get angry because I didn't answer your question. So don't don't do trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com on my email and then we'll be able to get that okay so try to think of some questions tonight because these are our last three questions that we have so far uh, on our uh, monday night bible q a okay so from rick and linda west here's the question and let me throw that up on your screen there and uh it'll kind of probably everything won't show up but most everything will from rick and linda west from the reading of john chapter 10 verses 22 to 23 did jesus did jesus observe the feast of dedication or was he just in jerusalem at this time is this feast the same as hanukkah thank you in advance for answering our bible questions rick and linda west go ahead brother you want to you haven't been on, on yeah. in a while so all right go yeah, ahead we'll brother. start this one off so <clears throat> let me start by saying this if you uh if you do a internet search on the uh the Feast of the Dedication, what most people are going to tell you is that this has to do with the uh, time of the Maccabees when the, uh, I believe it was a Syrian king had come and, and set up abominations in the temple and so on and so forth. So they cleansed and rededicated the temple after their revolt. And they're going to say that's what this is. And, and, and listen, when I, when I search the scripture, right, because we, we we've been the we we've, we've been down this road. Maccabees is not scripture. God finished writing in Malachi. He was done talking to him for a while, right? So we're we're not gonna take that as scripture. But if you would, the only other cross reference I could find to something uh, quite similar was Second Chronicles chapter seven. Let's go there. I believe that has a couple more. Second Chronicles chapter seven. Just looking at feasts in general, but in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, the Bible says in verse number 8, also at that same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days and all Israel with him, a very great congregation from the entering in of Hamath under the river of Egypt. And in the eighth day, they made a solemn assembly for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days so here we have a feast that is also called a dedication or at least is associated with the dedication of the altar when solomon built it now um that's that's what we find there and the other part of that question was john chapter number 10 uh john chapter number 10 <coughs> Did Jesus participate in it, or was uh, was he uh, observing it? The Bible says in verse twenty two, and it was at uh, and it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. It, there's really not enough there that you could say he observed it or he didn't observe it. Right. There's not enough there to say he partook or he didn't partake. Um, 
we do know that the Lord Jesus Christ was there and did partake of several feasts. Uh, we see it in John 7 and other places. But, uh, but ultimately, ultimately, we do know that this was one of the feasts of the Jews. Uh, they've got multiple. Brother Ed will go over those in a minute, I'm sure. The only one I could find that was associated with feast and dedication was that of the altar and the building of the temple in the days of Solomon. And, uh, you know, that, like I said, if you if you do an Internet search, they're going to tell you, oh, this is uh, the time of the Maccabees and it's Hanukkah. Um, but I, I'm not I'm not going to stand on that because I don't have scripture to back it up. So I'm not going to go beyond the scripture in uh, in what it says, because the time of the Maccabees, if, if it's nice history, it's nice history, but it's not the word of God. I'm going to stick with what the Bible says. And if the Bible doesn't say, if you want to make speculation, make speculation, that's fine. But let's call it what it is, speculation and not, um, you know, we know of a certainty that this is that or the other thing. And so anyway, that's uh, that's all I've got. There's really not a whole lot to that that I can put together there, but I'll let Brother Ed take it from here. All right. Appreciate that, Brother Justin. Well, I would say John 10, 22 and 23. Um, here's what I got on it. The feast was appointed by Judas Mac Maccabeus to commemorate the... I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. Lighten up, man. I just... I just and I just watched a guy say a prayer, and he said, amen, and a woman. <laughs> we got to lighten up, guys. We got to lighten up here. Um, not a whole lot of people online or in our government know any Bible. You can't trust any of that, okay? Um, we don't. What I'd like you to do is open up your Bible to the New Testament. <laughs> Would you do that? Oh, I'm sorry. New Testament meant. Yeah, New, New Testament. Um, I want you to turn to um, Matthew chapter five. Turn it to Matthew chapter five and then go to verse 17. Matthew 5, 17. Think not. Now, here's the Lord Jesus Christ talking right here. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, was that all the law or just some of the law? That was all the law, correct? For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, as far as the dedication, and I am really, I am not too keen on the observance of the Feast of Dedication. I'm not sure uh, how that ties into Numbers chapter 7 as far as a, you know, a you know, a dedication to the altar as far as it actually being a law that needed to be kept to fulfill the law uh, for Jesus Christ. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. And that's why I'm not dogmatic about it or anything like that. But I do know that if it is, if, if it is uh, a requirement for the Jews to observe, then certainly I believe that on that basis, Jesus would have observed it. Okay. Now that's kind of where I stand on that. Now, if you would, um, Justin hit Second Chronicles, and I'm just going to cross-reference a few more here. Uh, Numbers seven ten, Numbers chapter seven, verse ten. Now um, let's go back, maybe a verse here, number seven nine. But unto the sons of Kohath he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them was that they should bear upon their shoulders. And the princess offered for dedicating of the altar in the day that it was anointed, even the princes offered their offering before the altar. And the Lord said unto Moses, they shall offer their offering each prince on his day for the dedicating of the altar. You see that there, 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 there's a sounds like it's a law given there. And if and if it was a law, certainly if it was required for all of Israel to do it or just a certain group of people to do it, like as we're, we're reading right here, then we can see that Jesus would have handled the law accordingly with the actual law that that's written in the letter. Okay. So we have that. Now that was the dedication of the altar. And Justin had uh, read St. Chronicles seven and we read number seven, uh, 10 to 11. And then there's another cross reference you can find in number 784, just further down in number seven. And then uh, uh, numbers 788. 
Okay, we can read about the dedication of the altar there. Now, if the Feast of Dedication was the dedicate, dedication of the altar or dedicating of the altar itself, then we would, you know, I don't know. How do you want to line that up? Do you want to be dogmatic about that? Because if you do, then go to Nehemiah 12.27. Go to Nehemiah 12.27. Now, we have the dedication or the dedicating of the altar in the day that it was anointed. And then we have the, ded the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem in Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27. Now read it. And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their, their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and with singing, with cymbals, psalteries, and with harps. And the sons of the singers gathered themselves together, both out of the plain country, round about Jerusalem, and from the village of of Netophatha, how do you how do you how do you say that, Justin? Netophathai, Neto, um, Netophathai. Which verse were you on? Nehemiah twelve twenty eight. Uh, at the end there, and from oh, the villages of yeah yeah Netophathai. I, I would guess. There you go. There you, Justin says better than I do. Amen. Praise the Lord. So there it is. The dedication of the wall of Jerusalem. Now, could it be that we got? Come on, we're, we're talking about. Dedication, right? We 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 talked we talked about the feast of dedication, but the feast of dedication to what? Now, I don't want to trust the commentators on it because it seems like they're they are they're just interjecting things that they have no scriptural support for. But you're just gonna believe them because they have scholarship. Come on, man, read your Bible. You have the Holy Spirit, He's beyond scholarship, He's the truth. Uh, people have scholarship and they're wrong all the time. Uh, re read your Bible. Let the Holy Spirit decide what it is. The dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, Nehemiah 12, 27. There's your, there's your reference. And then let's do another one. So we got three here. The dedication of the house of God. Look at Ezra 6, 16 to 17. Now let's go there. Turn there in your Bible. In the New Testament or uh, on the Old Testament. Um, Testament. All right. Ezra 616. So let's go ahead and read this. And the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the now, now watch the dedication of this house of God with joy and offered at the dedication of this house of God and hundred bullocks, 200 rams, 400 lambs and for a sin offering for all Israel, 12 he goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. This is not a, this is not a small feast of dedication here. This thing's huge. It's literally a feast. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, you want me to be dogmatic about this. It doesn't say, it just calls it the, in John 10, 22 and 23, the feast of dedication. Now, if it was a matter pertaining to the law and it was, it was to be observed, then you can rest assured that Jesus Christ did that because he fulfilled all the law. That's why we read Matthew 5, 17 and 18. But if it wasn't a requirement, then yeah, he probably, you know, probably wouldn't have been a big deal for him to observe it or not. But, um, but I, I, I think, you know, Jesus wouldn't give anybody any reason to question the validity of him keeping all the law. So I don't know, maybe he just did it to, just to do it. Just, you know, you know, we got this, uh, what's that verse in Romans eight, about is it no Romans 14 about the weaker brethren? He might have just partook of it for the weaker brethren. Who knows? Um, but anyways, so we got three there. Now you want to be dogmatic. I got three there. I mean, you want to say it's Hanukkah, you're gonna believe, you know, commentators, you know, uh the Maccabian culture and all that, uh, Ant Antiochus Epiphanes and all the, all this other stuff that you learn about in, in these, this book of Maccabees, or you're just gonna believe your Bible. And then you can find out some points of dedication throughout Jewish history that talked about there's a dedication of the altar, a dedication of the wall of Jerusalem and dedication of the house of God and choose between those or maybe Jesus fulfilled all three. Maybe he didn't partake of all three because it wasn't required by law to do so. Who knows? So anyways, that's that's my best guess. And I tried to stay as, as close to the scriptures as I could with it. But again. I can't be really dogmatic about that. I know we want to 
say what this feast of dedication was with without a shadow of a doubt but there's i'm sorry i'm i'm, I'm hanging with justin on this one there's just not enough information about this and it would be great if it said in john 10 everything what jesus did right there like he kept this feast of dead then i i could say let, let's just go deeper into the scriptures and talk about how he kept that or whatever but uh, i don't really find that anywhere in there that was dogmatic about this thing okay so anyways it's just food for thought there maybe uh, hopefully some helpful things so i don't know if you got anything else justin no no that's it on that one Okay. All right. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on here. We're good on time. Now we're going to be doing Michael Odom's Michael Odom's question. And let me put it on the screen there. So there it is. So Michael Odom says, could you explain second Timothy four five specifically? What is the work of an evangelist? What is the work of an evangelist? So, I remember, um, I'm going to go ahead and take this one first since Justin started on the last one. Um, I had did something. I don't, I don't think Justin was here when I did it, or, or maybe you were. I'm not sure. Um, where Rick and Linda West asked about, excuse me, they asked about uh, missionary. I don't, I don't think you were. You might not I have. Think, been. I think I was in on that one. I okay. Yeah. yeah. So just kind of be, just be a little recap, a little rerun of some of that. Um, but I won't go through every single detail. We'll just kind of lump some everything up here. If you look at the No Webster's 1828 dictionary of the word evangelist, it is a writer of the history or doctrines, precepts, actions, life, and death of our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, as the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then I got a preacher or publisher of the gospel of Jesus Christ licensed to preach, but not having charge of a particular church. So when I was, you know, because Brother Ed sometimes asks questions too, you know, and um, I asked Brother James, I said, well, what do you think in a, in a nutshell, what do you think an evangelist would be if I was to answer a question, what of evangelist? What is an evangelist? And Brother James had told me uh, an evangelist is a church planter. It's a church plant. He's a church planter. And Acts 21, 8, if you look, 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 look at this one and Acts 21, 8, it says, and the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven and abode with him. So you have the terminology evangelist and there were people that were actually evangelists. And I believe that if you look at the definition of an apostle, I mean, the scriptural definition of an apostle, I'd say um, you had to have these qualifications to be an apostle. And the work of an apostle would be to establish foundation. That's why there's no apostles today, because nobody's establishing foundation. That's already been established by the original 12. Okay. Now, Judas excluded because he was replaced by Matthias. But Ephesians 2.20 is your cross-reference. If you think that I'm out of line saying that apostles are foundations, read Ephesians 2.20. Okay? Uh, uh, the foundation is laid upon the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Okay? So we're not talking about any apostle. We're not talking about we're not talking about anybody today that calls themselves an apostle. We're talking about the ones that actually have the qualifications of Acts chapter one, when there was no New Testament complete yet, there was no word of God uh, concerning the New Testament yet. And then so the apostles were were through signs, wonders and miracles, establishing the word of God and the precedence of the what it was going to be written down everything that the the holy spirit and the lord jesus christ wanted written down was going to be laid out and once that was complete no more need for apostles right so why do i why do i got to say all that i mean we're kind of rerunning a lot of things because think about this paul was an apostle correct but paul is also a witness he calls himself a servant He's a witness too. So wait a minute. If Paul's a witness, he can't be an apostle. Well, apostles and witnesses are different. Well, no, not necessarily. Um, there's a lot of titles within the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. But even though they're titles, a lot of those titles encompass a lot of the other gifts. So yes, every apostle is a witness, but not every witness is an apostle. See, see where we're going with that? Not ever, I'll say it like this. Paul was an apostle 
And his main work in the book of Acts, you can just go through the book of Acts, look at his main work. He's going from city to city and he's preaching, right? He's witnessing. He goes into the synagogues first, right? Then he goes to the Gentiles. He's going to both. And what happens is he's establishing first the, the testimony of Jesus as a witness. Then he's establishing places for people to go when they get saved. He establishes a meeting place where all the believers can go. You see that? That is the, that get ready. That is the work of an apostle slash a work of an evangelist. See that church planter. Paul was a church planter, but he wasn't only a church planter. He went out and witnessed, but when he went out and witnessed, they needed some place to go. So he would have to have the work of an evangelist as well as a church planter. You see, see, see what we're talking about? Because when you look at what Paul did and he established all these churches, he came back through. He came back through to check upon all the churches that were established to see how they were doing. Ain't it a shame? How many people actually do that kind of stuff today? I mean, yeah, everybody wants to be called an apostle, but nobody wants to do the work that Paul actually did. He actually went out and witnessed on the street corners. He actually went in the synagogues and preached to these people. And then when these people got saved, he had a place for them to go and then tried to teach them while they were there, um, right doctrine, right truth. And then he'd leave and go preach somewhere else. And then later, once he's done all this, he's come, he'll come back through and follow up on the people. We ought to we ought to act like that. That ought to be our outline when we're in the ministry. But apparently, a lot of people don't know their left hand from their right hand when it comes to to the ministry like this. So, an evangelist is a church planter. I, I can see that through the example of Paul as well in there. So, let me see if I had anything else on that. And if I don't, I'm going to pass it over. Yeah, yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. I'll, I'll let go ahead, Justin. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, brother. All right. Well, uh, that's good stuff. And and yeah, just like he's saying, that this would be what we often think of as the modern day missionary, the person who, who goes out, witnesses, tries to get a church started, things like that. Uh, take a look at Acts chapter 21. Ed mentioned this. Let's let's take a look at it here. And uh, it says in Acts chapter 21, verse number eight, in the next day. We that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist. Philip is the evangelist, which was one of the seven, right? Go back to Acts chapter 6, and abode with him. Now, Philip is called an evangelist, but why? Well, just like Brother Ed even read in the definition, you know, that it's, it's one who, who preaches the gospel, but doesn't have care of the church. Right? He's not the pastor of a church, so to speak, but he is uh, he is one that is gifted, we'll look at that in a second, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to lost people. Uh, Acts chapter 1, while we're here, verse number 8, And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. <laughs> So everyone who has received the Holy Spirit of God, that has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, that is saved, is called to be a witness, right? You are commanded to witness. That's Amen. to tell lost people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look at Acts chapter 8, and we'll actually see what Philip does. Acts chapter 8. Uh, let's go verse number <clears throat> three. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered, or yeah, they that were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Philip's the evangelist. What did he do? He went somewhere, preached Christ unto people. <laughs> And the people with uh, one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Then you keep going down Acts chapter 8. Uh, let's see, go down to verse number 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Ga Ga Gaza, Gaza, uh, which is desert. 
And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopians, of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit of, uh, said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself up to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what he readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. Uh, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. What's the work of an evangelist? Someone that goes out and preaches Jesus. That's the work. Now, of course, the act is witnessing, but uh, it, it does go deeper, right? It's not just going out and telling people about Jesus. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says... Uh, Verse number nine, now he that ascended, what is it, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, gave gifts to men. And some of one of those gifts, at the very least, one of those gifts is evangelism. But if God gifted you and you don't do the work, what good is it? Right. And you say, well, I want to witness, but I don't think that's my gift. Hold on. Go to, uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh Verse 28, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. So God says, God says, not only are you commanded to preach the gospel, but if you want to be an evangelist, you want to have the gift of evangelism, you got to want it. According to God, covet earnestly the best gifts. Say, you know, I just, I just don't think I'm gifted to speak to people and talk to them and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, well, you're commanded to witness. But if you really want that gift, man, ask God for it. Go after it. Go put it to use, right? The thing in, a, in another place, it says, stir up the gift that is in thee, right? God gave it to you, but you got to do something with it. You got to do something with it. And uh, if you don't think you've got it, ask God for it, right? There's no reason you can't ask God for it. No reason you shouldn't ask God for it. Uh, in fact, uh, evangelism is, uh, is, is a great thing. I certainly enjoy it myself, going out, talking to lost people, trying to win them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, God tells us to covet, desire, earnestly, the best gifts. Of course, we can move on to the chapter 13 and talk about those gifts. But in either case, we do know that a gift is evangelism. God tells us to covet it. Ask the Lord for it. Ask the Lord to help you, but you got to do your part. You got to go out there and use that gift. So uh, that's what I would encourage you with. Do the work of an evangelism. It is a must. And Timothy, you know, we call it the pastoral epistle because uh, Timothy is left there to pastor the church at Ephesus. And uh, and so what does he tell him to do? Do the work of the evangelist. Uh, I, I'll give you one illustration just real quick, and then I, I will move on to the next question. There was a church in Lake Mary. I think, Brother Ed, you know that church. Had invited, I think you preached there too a couple times. I preached there a couple times. Their pastor had left them, uh, so they didn't have a pastor for a little while. We were preaching, uh, me and Brother Ed, a couple other guys from the church. We were all preaching at that church intermittently, just taking rotation. And uh, 
I asked the only deacon they've got, who's a qualified deacon, good man, loves the Lord, honestly. Uh, anyway, uh, I asked him, what do you think happened that the church is in such decline? And he said, we stopped evangelizing. They used to go out knocking doors. They used to give out tracts. They used to have personal witness. Now, maybe they didn't preach on the street. And that's, you know, if you want to knock on doors, knock on doors. If you want to just try and stop people and have one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. conversation, stop people and have one-on-one -on -one conversation. I'm for all of that. God for all of that. But, uh, but because they stopped evangelizing, what happened? The church wore down. And there were not many people left in the church uh, by the time we were preaching there. And he said, and not only so, but the pastor that they had previously made excuse for the people to not go out and evangelize. And so it's so important that the church actually does this, that God gives us that command we see there in 2 Timothy. Do the work of an evangelist. You must get out there on the street, door to door, win people to Lord Jesus Christ. Because, you know, listen, people talk about growing the church by having babies. That's a first, that's the first birth. The the way the church grows is with the second birth. You know, so that's that's key. You got to go out there and win people to Lord Jesus Christ. You got to knock on doors, preach out there, talk to people, tell them about the Lord, ask them about their soul. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I'll tell you this too, and then we'll leave it be. But Brother Ed and I, and I think a lot of people in our church, you got to press the issue these days. Don't just ask them, are you saved? Are you going to heaven when they die? Everybody says yes. Right. Everybody thinks they're saved. Everybody thinks they're going to heaven when they die. Ask them, how do you know? Ask them open-ended questions. Get them to come out with what it is they're really trusting in their heart. And, right. And tell them about Jesus Christ, how he died for their sins and rose from the dead. So, Brother Ed, I'll let you... Go on to the next one, unless you got something you want to add. Yeah, uh, just one thing, one thing here. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. Look at this one. I, and I'll just close out the uh, so we can get to the next question after this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 is focusing on how we are saved and reconciled and has given us the, watch this, the qualification by giving us the ministry, but it, it comes at the price of believing on Jesus Christ. That comes at the price of salvation and redemption of Christ on the cross for your sins. Every single person that's saved by the blood of Christ has this qualification right here. And the qualification, well, watch this, 2 Corinthians 5.18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled. Now, now look at the word us reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now, he just didn't stop right there. He says, and hath given to us, or only given to those that are on fire for the Lord, the ministry of reconciliation. Only those that are on fire for the Lord, only Brother James, only Brother David in our church, only the deacons, only Brother Justin, <laughs> only Brother Ed, no hath given to us, who? Those in the first part of the verse, who hath reconciled us. Are you reconciled to God? You're part of the us right there. And hath given to us the ministry, that's huge, a ministry of reconciliation. Now, what are we to do with this ministry of reconciliation? Sit at home and watch football? No, this is focusing on what we are to do with the ministry in verse 19, what are we to do with the ministry of reconciliation? And it's to focus on God's desire to reconcile the world through the means of the word of reconciliation. This is our ministry. Evangelism, um, witnessing, come on, door to door, public evangelism. What? Come on, everybody can't do everything, but everybody can do something. 2 Corinthians 5.19, to wit. You see that word to wit right there? That's like the root word of witness. <laughs> To wit, <laughs> that God was in Christ. Do I have to witness this to you so you can go out and witness that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself? Do you see our ministry of reconciliation right there? It's not just for us to be reconciled. It's so that we, through the ministry of rec reconciliation, because of the result of us being reconciled, now we, through Christ, 
are going to attempt, right? None of us can reconcile the whole world, but we can attempt to go person to person with the idea and the heart's desire of reconciling the world unto Jesus Christ. And that's what he's doing right there. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And how is he doing that? right here, and hath committed unto us. That's how he's doing it. Committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And then uh, we are ambassadors for Christ. He didn't say we, some of us are ambassadors for, or the pastor's an ambassador for Christ. That, I mean, I know we want to put that there, but it's not, it's not the case. Uh, you need to face reality. We're living in a world of fairy tales and a woman's and all that. We need to face reality. Reality is that words mean things, and it says we are, are, not will be, or yet will be one day. We are ambassadors for Christ. Who, who has a job that's doing it and doesn't do the job? That would be somebody that's either robbing from that person, not doing the job they're supposed to do when they are of that job. What are you? Are you are you? Stealing from Christ? You're, you are an ambassador for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. How many people have you told, be reconciled to God today? <laughs> Probably not a lot, but there it is. It starts with that, be reconciled to God. And then when they want to be reconciled to God, they get saved and put their faith and trust that Christ died for their sins and rose again the third day. And they need somewhere to go. And that's part of the ministry of reconciliation is not only preaching the gospel, which is great. We need to do that first. People need to be saved first, but they got to have a place where they can go to meet. And that's what we're talking about with the evangelist and church planter. So there it is. Some responsibility for each and every one of us. Don't just say you're saved. Be saved because it comes with a responsibility. Amen. All right, let's 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 move on here. And final question here. Man, we're really good on time, Justin. Yeah, yeah, we did it. Amen. So let me get uh, Michael. Oh, we did Michael Odom. We're doing Barry Bernard. Barry Bernard. All right. Thanks. Uh, or hi, brother Ed and Justin. Thanks for uh, willing hearts to help us understand something we don't understand in the scriptures. Praise the Lord. P appreciate the encouragement there, uh, brother Barry, to take time of your schedule to answer our questions. My question is, I came across a verse in Acts 9, verse 6. B, arise, go into the city, and quote, unquote, it shall be told thee what it shall be told thee what thou must do. I tried to figure out this it. Who is this referring to? The only timeline was in Genesis 3.15 that Jesus, that's Jesus's body. Who is this it in this verse? Thanks, Barry. All right, bro, Justin, you got it. All right. So uh, this, I think, is pretty straightforward. If, if you consider it is um, in place of something else, if you were going to say it's the Lord's body, right, you would go to uh, Acts chapter nine and verse number six. The Bible says, uh, eh, hold on a second, sorry, <clears throat> allergies. And he trembling and astound astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, arise, go into the city and. My body shall be told thee what thou must do. It, it wouldn't make any sense. And so the it shall be told Paul or Saul what he must do. So it's a command. The it is a command. That's all it is. I mean, it's just um, we put the, the it there in place of what would happen later on in the chapter. Uh, let's go to verse 15 the bible says but the lord said to him go thy way for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the gentiles and the kings and the children of israel for i will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake and ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him and said brother saul the lord even jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And so 
uh, the Bible says that Ananias was sent to him. And later we read, you know, he gave him some instruction. So what happened? It was told him he received commandment through Ananias from God. And that's all it is. It's not, uh, I don't think it's anything uh, tricky from there, but uh, you know, just the it, you got to consider what's going to happen to it. It shall be told him. So he has to be able to hear it and obey it. And it's just a command. That's that's how it is in uh, this chapter. And you see in other places in Acts, as, the, as uh, Paul gives his testimony, that he does receive commandment from the Lord. And uh, that's that's what that it is. So, Brother Ed, I'll let you take it from there. Amen. I mean, Justin hammered it. I mean, he, he got it. The nail on the head right there. Um Maybe just expound on what the it is a little bit more. Maybe I can do that since Justin already answered the question there. Um, again, uh, just to kind of rehash some of this, uh, the it in Acts 9, 6, in the context, the it is not a who, but a what. Because if you look at Acts 9, 6, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, now look, what, what wilt thou have me to do? He didn't say who wilt thou have me to do. He says, what? Well, so we're talking about a what, not a who. And I know that's the question. Well, what, you know, and then when you read arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Um, certainly, if you only read B in Acts 9, 6, you know, the last half of the verse, um, certainly you, you can get confused because you're not looking at the question being asked in A, Acts 9, 6, A. So you need to put the A there first and then. You'll have the, the the context for the B, and then Justin was was uh, right on point. Acts nine fifteen. If if you look at it, he he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Colon. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. That's the it. That's the it in nine six. Justin just said it. Acts nine fifteen and sixteen. And to kind of add to that, add to that, um, go to Acts twenty six. He kind of just, uh, he goes a little further and gives you more detail about this when he's testifying to Agrippa what happened to him when he got, when, when the Lord spoke to him, you know, when he got saved. So start in verse 17, Acts 26, 17. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. So he's, he's giving his testimony here. Uh, Paul's talking and he's talking about how Jesus said these things to him. And then verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now look, whereupon, O King Agrippa, watch, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. He was not disobedient to the it. <laughs> yeah. See that? That's there it is. That's that that's the whole answer right there. And um you can see that it's uh there's no confusion there, but I think a lot of times uh when we read the Bible, I mean, present party included, we read the Bible, sometimes we we really key in onto some words that sometimes they don't really need to be keyed into because we're just trying to get as much as we can out of the word of God. And sometimes we think there's something there when it really may not be uh, that couldn't be solved by the context. So I uh, appreciate the question. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's out of whack to ask a question like that because sometimes th there are truths like that, that are in the Bible where you do zoom in on a it or on a thing or on something like that. And there's a lot of biblical truth and a lot of doctrine around it. So no, by, by, by no means that's, that's not uh, out of the question to ask a question like that. So I do appreciate your desire. Um, uh, and your, your, your heart to want to know the answer and to be able to receive a lot of times the answers we give rightly divided. And, and again, I like to throw this out there as we're about to close out. Uh, don't think that when you get on the broadcast, brother Ed and brother Justin are the final say, I mean, don't, don't, don't get down. Don't, I mean, with the Bible rightly divided. Okay. Yeah. I mean, cause the Bible is the final authority. I mean, but don't, don't sit there and be like, you know, we're the, the gurus to go to, you know, that, you know, brother Ed, brother Justin are, you know, vicars of Christ. I mean, none of that. Okay. I mean, some people really take, take it to the, 
to the limit right there. And, and um, we, we do our best to answer your questions. Uh, we, we don't mind. Uh, we'll do our best to give you as much scripture as we can on a, on a given topic. But uh, I'm not right about every single thing. Okay. And, and I want you to think, so I'm not a, some Pope you got to bow down to and kiss my ring, my ring. Okay. Um, we are doing our best. Uh, yeah. It may be true that me and brother Justin may know a lot more Bible than what you're used to on a, on an online broadcast, but by no means are we Mr. Know-it-alls. Okay. Um, if you want to stump us with something, you probably could. Okay. Um, we're just on here to try to be the blessed. Uh, the, uh, we want to be a blessing to as many people as we can with the knowledge that we've obtained over the years. That's all, that's all we're on here to do. We're beggars leading other beggars to the, to the bread of life. Amen. And so if you don't get this idea that, you know, we're self-righteous or we're on here talking down to people, we, I, I know there's been times people gone on here and gave us a hard time and, and stuff like that. And I got to deal with the, the people accordingly because we've got to get on here and, and answer questions. We don't have time to play, you know, the wits game. You know, I know more than you game. I don't want to play that game. Look, if you don't, if you can't learn nothing from me, maybe you need to go to a Bible broadcast. That's better than my, my broadcast or me and brother Justin's broadcast. Maybe you need to find a better broadcast. I mean, uh, we're, me and Brother Justin are going to do the best in the knowledge that we have, and we care about people on here. We care about your walk with the Lord. If you're saved and if you're lost, we care. If We don't want you to die in your sin. We don't want you to go to hell, and, and we're going to do our best to, to direct you to Jesus Christ and his finished cross work, but we, we're not going to sit there and, and play a wits game and, and try to convince you through debating. We're not going to do that. We're just going to we're going to answer questions, and we're going to do our best to lead you to Jesus Christ in a in a Q and A forum, and um and there it is that that's and that's the transparency of my of my broadcast here of how me and brother Justin want to do it, and I hope if you're if you're not saved you get saved today, and I'm going to close this out. Trust, believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose again a third day, and if you're saved. Stop arguing about all these little petty things, man. Stop arguing about, you know, giants in the earth and the gap theory and all this other stuff. You know, it, it, you know, Christmas. Like, come on. I had a bunch of people unf unfriend me for Christmas. I'm like, you don't agree with my stand on Christmas? Great. But you're going to tell me you're going to unfollow me for, for Christmas. You follow me for years. And for Christmas, you unfollow me. It's like, and I even say on my, a lot of times when I'm preaching or I'm leaving polls, say, look, if you don't agree with my stand on Christmas, great. But well, what about the thousand other things that you do agree with me on? You know, you're just going to, you know, follow me for, for, come on, this is petty things is what people divide over. Can our fellowship be in Christ? Can our fellowship be on the cross work of Jesus Christ? A lot of times it can't be because we're so carnal. If somebody don't agree with us, we've got to unfollow from them. They don't agree with everything. They've got to agree with everything. Now, you stay on this Q&A and hear me and Justin talk. Stay on this Q&A for a little while, for, for a couple of weeks, for a couple of months, for a couple of years. You are bound to find something you don't agree with. But I just, want to I just want to provoke you and exhort you in such a way that no matter what church you go to, you're going to find somebody you don't agree with. No matter what pastor you go to, you're going to find somebody you don't agree with. No matter what family member that you love, you're going to find one family member that you don't agree with. So you're going to, agree, you're, you're going to disagree about something. So this idea about you have to agree, we have to agree with you on everything is just completely irrational. It's not, it's not rooted in reality, okay? Um, you're, you're asking for something that's impossible. We are not going to agree on everything. So have grace where you don't agree with us <laughs> and stay on. Maybe you might learn something that you didn't know before. And if you already know everything, well, praise the Lord. You can tell Jesus already figured it all out, okay? So, but for now... We're going to continue to try to help you grow in grace. And me and brother Justin are here learning as well. Uh, we're at our church learning all the time. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and close it out. Hope you guys uh, take heed to the uh, gospel message and the encouragement to keep living for Jesus. I'm going to pass it over to Justin to close out, brother. Go ahead. Amen. Thanks, brother Ed. Thanks for those that ask questions. Keep it up. Uh, certainly enjoy time in the Bible. Love, love preaching it. Love looking at it. Love reading it, studying it. And, uh, it really is. It's the best best thing you can do with your your time, your life. You're gonna stand before God one day. I, number one, I hope you're saved. Number two, 
if if all God gave us was this was this book as far as things out in the world to do to look at to read to set your eyes upon, uh, <clears throat> and you read news websites or newspapers or text messages, but but you don't set your eyes upon this book, upon the words of this book. Something wrong. Get in the book. Love the book, man. I'm telling you, that's uh, God said in the Book of Deuteronomy. These words are not a vain thing. It is your life. It is your life. These are the words of life. Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And that's what they are. You can receive it. Life, life more abundantly getting in that book. So, amen. God bless you all. And uh, have a good night. A woman. Oh, oh I meant amen. <laughs>